hallelujah. We serve an awesome God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Our God is awesome. We bless and praise his name for the privilege of another day. And as I often say, it's just good to be alive. There is no place I'd rather be. I wouldn't want to be in the most palatial cemetery, not in the most comfortable hospital bed. I'm glad to be in the Lord's house. on the Lord's day, amen. I want to talk today, this being the first Sunday, and this being the last month of the quarter as we continue to try to reiterate the theme and the focus of fellowship, I want to talk today from the sermonic theme, do your best thinking. I want to talk about do your best thinking. It is quite obvious and clear that if the suggestion is to do your best thinking, then obviously there are times when we don't do our best thinking, amen. The scriptural and biblical reference for our message today uh, is found in a Christian epistle that is called Philippians chapter four. Philippians chapter number four. Our text will be centered around verses 8 and 9 of Philippians chapter number, number 4. Philippians chapter number 4, verses 8 and 9. We're reading from the King James Version translation of the Bible. On today, it simply says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report. If there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. Thus is the reading of the word of our God. The grass withereth, the flower thereof fadeth away. But the word of our God shall stand forever. Do me a favor. Look at your neighbor and say to your neighbor, Neighbor, I need you to do your best thinking. You may be seated in the presence of of the Lord. <clears throat> Growing up in the southeastern part of Oklahoma afforded me many wonderful experiences and many notable memories. 
some of my fondest memories, particularly during my preteen and teenage years, was centered around my uncle, whose name was J.T. Evans. He did not have a first name. He did not have a middle name. His name was J.T. Uncle J.T. was a construction worker. He was a big man, tall and, and large. Served for over 45 years as, as a deacon at the Mount Zion Church in my little hometown of Muskogee, Oklahoma. He was a big man, but he was a quiet man. Uncle J.T. seldom said anything, and when he spoke, what he said was worth listening to. During my preteen years, during my teenage years, he was very influential and very inspirational in my, my life. And often, when he discovered that I had something to do, whether it was a test at school, whether it was an event with my friends, Uncle JT's advice to me was simply this, do your best thinking. Son, whatever you do, make certain that you do your best thinking. As I was preparing this message for this morning, the Spirit of God caused my mind to revisit the sound and sagely advice of my Uncle J.T. Though he rests now in the bosom of the Lord, there was validity, there was substance, there was unlimited wisdom in his words, son, just do your best thinking. How many of you on this morning would agree that there are times, particularly in your life as a Christian, that you've not done your best thinking? Truth of the matter is, I think all of us could revisit our pre-Christian days and easily admit and acknowledge that we did some foolish things. Do me a favor. This is a good time to wake your neighbor up, reach over and touch him. Tell him, wake up, wake up. Amen. Don't want you to be guilty of doing one of those foolish things. Amen. Many of us will admit that we've done some foolish things. And regrettably, anyone who does not admit that they've done foolish stuff, that's evidence that I don't need to say any more, amen. Because the only way to overcome and to progress and to move forward is an admittance of what you've already done. I, I, I was reading this, this text, this Christian epistle that's written by Paul, this Pauline epistle that is called Philippians, only four chapters, but in these four chapters, Paul is striving to get the Philippian church to do their best thinking. As a matter of fact, as, as a matter of fact, in, in the opening of chapter number four, you'll discover that there are two women, Euda and Suntiki, who are at odds in the church. And the entire book is about making 
sound decisions. The entire book is about how sound decisions impact relationships between people. How, how, how sound decisions and good rational thinking causes there to be the maintenance of strong fellowship in the body of the church. As a matter of fact, there are three little points that I want to lift uh, today, and I'm going to move out of your way because, listen, my beloved, Paul is writing from his prison cell in Rome. Notably, this church is dear to him because in chapter number four, verse number one, he calls them dearly beloved. He calls them dearly beloved twice. But not only does he call them dearly beloved, but get this, he calls them his joy and his crown. Note, notice that Paul gives this church a distinction that no other church founded by him has. Paul says to the Philippian church that you are my joy and you are my crown. In other words, Paul is saying to them, you are the model church. You are the church if, if the other churches, the church at Corinth and the church at Thessalonica and the other churches that I have founded, if, if they are to be what they are supposed to be, then they need to strive to emulate you. For you are my joy and you are my crown. But right now what Paul is saying, although you are my joy and you are my crown, you are in the midst of not necessarily making wise decisions, which is a prime indicator that you can be saved and still be foolish. That you can be saved and still not make the right decisions that you can be saved and still exercise carnal thinking, that you can be saved, somebody's going to get it in a moment, and still act inappropriately. You can be saved and still do things that do not bring God glory and honor. You've got to understand that the objective of the church is to be who we are to Christ. As the Philippian church was the joy and the crown of Paul, we are to be the joy and the crown of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, when people look at us, they ought to see a people who represent the Lord Jesus Christ. When they look at us, they ought to see a people who typify the principles of Christ. When they look at us, they need to see a people who strive to do their best thinking. Do you not know today that one of the objectives of the enemy is to get you to think irrationally? Don't you know that the enemy wants you to think irrationally? He does not want you to think godly. But if we are to examine what Paul writes unto the Philippian church, the first thing that we need to understand is the origin or the basis of our thinking. And in order to get what Paul says is the origin of our thought process, then what we've got to do is we've got to revisit what Paul says back 
in chapter number one. If you look in Philippians chapter number one, you will discover something. You will discover that Paul says in verse number six, these words, he says, being confident of this very thing that he who hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul says that if you're going to do your best thinking, you've got to put your confidence in the right place. Somebody missed what I just said. If you're going to do your best thinking, your thinking has to be predicated and based upon a sure foundation. In chapter 1, verse number 6, Paul says, what is that foundation? He says, you need to be confident. You need to know this very thing, that he who hath begun a good work in you. In other words, you need to be confident in the one who has assigned you the work. You need to be confident in the one who made you, the one who breathed life into you. If you're going to do your best thinking, I often tell people while you're trying to figure out who you are and what you're all about, you've got to understand you'll never understand who you are until you know who God is. You'll never know who you are until you know the God who made you. And that's what Paul is saying in chapter 1, verse number 6. He says, you need to know and be confident that God who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You need, my brothers and sisters, if you're going to do your best thinking, you've got to be confident, confident in the right somebody You've got to be confident in God. Never put more confidence in yourself than you put in God. I wish I had a witness here. Never, never put more confidence in yourself. That, that's one of the major and primary problems in society today. And there's nothing wrong with self confidence. But understand, you cannot even have self-confidence until you have confidence in the divine one. You can never know who self is until you recognize that it's in him that I live and move and have my being. If God doesn't bless me, I won't be blessed. If God doesn't open a door, then a door can't be open. If God doesn't move obstacles, then there will be obstacles in my path because my confidence is never in who I am, but in whose I am. I am in the hands of an almighty God. Somebody here today, you need to wake up and start doing your best thinking. It's not about your education. It's not about your job. It's not about your influence. It's not about your prestige, but it's all about him. Look at what he says. He says, being confident. If you're going to do your best thinking, you need to know today that nobody can stop you from what God has begun in your life. Somebody missed what I just said. Nobody can stop you. Not even yourself. Nobody can stop you. What God has for you I wish I had some help in this place. What God has for me is for me. Can't nobody block it. Can't nobody stop it. I wish I had a witness here. 
and you need to know that every delay in your life is in God's favor. You need to know that God is able, even though situations may block you or seek to stop you, God is able because God is a deliverer and God can lift you above every issue and every problem in your life. So if you're going to do your best thinking, you need to be confident. But then in chapter 1, he said this. He says you need to be filled. Hello, somebody. You need to be filled because when you look in verse number 11, I've got to run through this text. He says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and the praise of God. Paul says in verse number 11, he says, listen, not only do you need to be confident and know the source, but you need to be filled with the power. One of the problems is everybody in here knows that without God, you couldn't make it. Have I got a witness here? For those of you in the house who don't know that, then just keep on living and you will discover it. But then it's not just enough to know that God is the one that keeps you and open doors for you. You also have to be filled with the fruits of righteousness. Understand, my beloved, if you're going to do your best thinking, it never pays to be in a relationship with God and not maximize the relationship. Somebody missed what I just said. What good is it to be in any relationship and not maximize the relationship? I wish I had a witness here. What good is it to be in any relationship and not want all of the benefits that are associated with the relationship? In verse number 11, he says, get this, he says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and the praise of God. Notice that he literally says that what God does is God wants you to be blessed in order that he might be praise. The objective is to be filled with the fruits of righteousness. Well, what are the fruits of righteousness? Galatians chapter 5, Paul in writing unto the church of Galatia, he gives unto them what are called the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Don't you recognize today, my beloved, that if you're going to do your best thinking, you might as well be filled with the power of God. All of us who are in the house today who own an automobile, we recognize that having the key, having ownership of the automobile, number one, and then having the key to the automobile is of no avail if it don't have gas. I wish I had a witness here. You can have the title to an automobile, you can have the key to the automobile, but if the automobile does not have any octane in it, then it is a useless automobile. Well, stay with me, somebody. I'm just trying to tell you, you can have a relationship with God, but if it don't have no gas in it, then what use is the relationship? What is the gas? The gas is the fruits of righteousness. You've got to understand that you've got to have love and you've got to have long sufferingness and you've got to have forbearance and you've got to have forgiveness. Talk to me, somebody. If you're going to be a child of God, then you ought to act like a child of God. As a matter of fact, the Bible puts it in this context, love even though those who despitefully use you. Love those who are backstabbers, those who are haters, those who don't mean you good. Why? Because you are in relationship with God and God does not hold you accountable for the behavior of others, but God does hold you accountable for your own behavior. Notice what he says. He says, 
You've got to be confident. He says, you've got to be filled. But then in verse number 12 of chapter number 1, he also said this, you've got to be tried. Stay with me, somebody. Notice, this is the origin. The origin is, is that you've got, my brothers and sisters, you've got to be confident. You've got to know where your source is. Number two, you've got to, get this, be filled with those things which are righteous. Number three, the things that you are filled with and the things that you are confident about, they are of no avail unless they be tried. Look in verse number 12, he says, but I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather or have happened rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. You've got to understand, and you'll never do your best thinking until you understand that the good and the bad work in your favor. Stay with me, somebody. You've got to understand that your best thinking is done on the premise of every day ain't going to be a good day. I wish I had a witness here. The truth of the matter is, my beloved, is that sometimes your worst days are in fact your best. Somebody missed what I just said. Your worst days are in fact your best because it's on your worst days that God is teaching you some valuable lessons. It's on your worst days that God has to teach you how to show enough pray. It's on your worst days. I wish I had some help in here. That God has to show you that he is a company keeper. That God is a lifter of your head. It's on your worst day that God has to show you that he's a sustainer and a keeper that God is a present help in a time of trouble it's on your y'all ain't feeling me when things are going well when your day is going smooth you too busy smiling you too busy being excited you too busy being jubilant but it's when there are trials in your life it's when it's black dark at noon time in your life that god gives you peace and god gives you comfort it's in those moments that God says, I am your every. It's when you try. It's when you try. Many of us, we don't do our best thinking because we believe every day ought to be peaches and cream. But the reality of life is simply this. You're going to have some good days and you're going to have some bad days. But get this. The substance of who you really are is based upon where your confidence is. That's in Jesus Christ. The second thing is it's based on what you're made out of. And what you're made out of, Reverend Cooper, is you're not made merely out of flesh and blood, but you're made up of the righteousness of God. As a matter of fact, Paul says over in Corinthians, he says, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we through Christ Jesus might become the righteousness of God. In other words, stay with me, somebody. I, I may not be all of that, and when folk look at me, they say, he ain't all of that, and they telling the truth, but the matter of the fact is, it isn't about who I am, it's about whose I am. And that's the mindset you ought to have. It's not about who I am, but it's about whose I am. Because the bottom line is, I'm finite, but he's infinite. The bottom line is, is that I have limitations on me, but he's eternal. The bottom line is, I don't have all power.
power. I have some power, but he has all power. The bottom line is there are things that I don't know, but he's omniscient and he knows everything. I wish I had a witness here. The bottom line is there's only so much I can handle, but he tells me in his word to cast all my cares upon him because he's able to handle anything. So it does not matter who I am. It matters whose I am. And if anybody asks you who I am, just tell them I'm a child of God. Now when you look at this epistle, you'll discover something. He says to them, you need to know the origin of good sense, of good logic, of good reasoning. The mind deals with the ability to reason. And one of the things is, my beloved, as Paul is writing unto them, he says, not only do you need to understand the, or the origin of good sense, but he says, you need to understand the objective of your thinking. You see, there are some of us who don't have objective thinking because we're too busy with subjective thinking. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. See, a lot of us don't think objectively because we're so subjective. Subjective thinking is based on me thinking about myself and wanting everything around me to conform to me. Ah, help me, Holy Ghost. Subjective thinking is based on the premise that everybody has to march to the tune of my drum. That everybody talk to me, somebody. Subjective thinking, at the center of it is me, myself, and I. But understand something, he says unto the Philippian church, if you're going to do your best thinking, you cannot think or dwell or focus on self. You have to be more concerned about caring about others. As a matter of fact, it's mind-boggling how Paul puts it because literally what Paul says is if you spend more time seeking to meet the needs in the lives of other people, it will actually make you to become a better person. But when you're being self-centered and only focusing on yourself, it narrows your capability to maximize the qualitative traits that God wants to place in you. L look at what he says. He says that the objective over in chapter number 2, in chapter number 2, verse number 1, look at what he says. He says in verse 1, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any tender mercies and compassions, he says, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. In other words, Paul literally says unto them, listen, if you're going to have an objective mindset, you've got to think on one accord. What is the one thing that we ought to think about? We ought to think about the fact that God is our God. But then secondly, we ought to think about being of service to other people. We ought to think about others more than ourselves. We ought to put others above ourselves. I wish I had a witness here. We need to have what is called personal humility. If you're going to think right, you've got to have personal humility. He goes on, my brothers and sisters, in verse number five, to say, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death 
of the cross. If you're going to do your best thinking, you know what? You do your best thinking by recognizing that I posture myself to be exalted by God when I humble myself. In other words, stay with me, somebody. Don't you know the best way up? is down? Don't you know that the best way to achieve is to go down in humility? Don't you know that pride cometh before destruction and destruction before a mighty fall? Don't you know that if you really want God to lift you up, you've got to humble and abase yourself in the very presence of God because God honors humility. Why should I humble myself? because Jesus humbled himself. Why should I humble myself? Because when I read further here in this writing, I determine something. Over in verse number 13, he talks about the fact that it is God who worketh in us to do of his good pleasure. In other words, God wants to use me not for my own self and grandizement, but God wants to use me for his good pleasure. In other words, don't you know today that God gets maximum usage out of you, not by what you accomplish, but rather by what you do for other people. God gets the glory when you do for other people. God gets the praise when you do for other people. God is lifted up when you do for other people. Do me a favor, help me preach just a little bit and I'm back out of here. Look at your neighbor and tell them if you really want to praise God, you got to do something for somebody else. Look at them and tell them if you really want to praise God, you got to do something for somebody else. Well, I got to let y'all go. This text is a powerful text. As we look at the text, we discover he shares with them the origin of what is called good or positive thinking. It reminds me of the late Norman Vincent Peale. Norman Vincent Peale was noted for positive thinking. Many individuals criticized Norman Vincent Peale because they said what he actually did was he took some of the beliefs of Scientology and mixed it with theology. But in reality, what he was doing was he was accentuating what is written in the Holy Writ. Because what Norman Vincent Peale believed is that if you change your thoughts, then you're able to change your world. Subsequently, in dealing with Paul's writings unto the Philippians, when we get to chapter number four, Paul, after sharing with them about humility, sharing with them about the origin of thinking, about the objective of thinking, which should be to help others and to emulate Christ. Then he concludes with dealing with what is called the occasion for good thinking. Because in chapter 4, verse number 1, you'll discover that these two women who were in the church were at odds with one another. They were at odds with one another because obviously both of them or either of them were not doing their best thinking. As a result of it, it was causing a rift in the body of Christ. As a result of it, it was causing chaotic, yes, occurrences in the body of Christ. And what Paul says unto them is that I encourage you to help these two sisters make peace with one another. I would encourage you to help these two sisters to do good and practical thinking. Why? Because in verse number five, Paul reminds them of the reality that the Lord is at hand. He says unto them, it pays to do your good and your best thinking and to remember that we're here to magnify 
and give him praise. And the reason is because the Lord is at hand. What do you mean, Pastor, by the fact that the Lord is at hand? The reality is that we don't know when the Lord is coming back. But there's one thing that we're sure of, and that is that he is coming back again. And so what Paul says unto them in the words of our text that are written in verses 8 and 9, he says unto them, finally, brethren, he says, whatsoever things are true, he says, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. He says, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, he says, you need to thank on these things. Notice what Paul is saying unto them is that if there is to be any moral excellence and if there is to be any commendation that is given unto man, it needs to be based on good thinking. He says you don't need to be going around thinking negativity, but what you need to do is to think positively. And can I tell you on today that every child of God ought to have good thoughts. I say every child of God ought to have good thoughts. In other words, uh, the enemy does not want you uh, to think good thoughts. Uh, and when you look in this text, uh, you'll discover that these two sisters were at odds uh, simply because of their thought process. Uh, but the bottom line is uh, that you ought not spend time uh, focusing uh, on other folk, uh, but you ought to spend time uh, focusing on your relationship with Jesus Christ. And what do you mean, Pastor? Well, while you're going about trying to do good unto all men, and especially those of the household of faith, you ought not be cynical and critical of other people, but you ought to be mindful of the goodness of God in your life. Have I got a witness here? You ought to be mindful of the reality of the fact that God has given me one more day and he's given me one more chance to be of service to my brother. He's given me one more day and he's given me one more chance to be in worship and praise. And I'm not going to spend my time thinking negative about nobody nor anything. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me. I'm going to bless his holy name. I'm going to bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and not forget his benefits. The Lord has been too good to us for us not to do our best thinking. Have I got a witness here? Every time the enemy starts to mess with your mind, what you need to do is you need to think of the Lord's goodness to you. Every time the enemy would cause you to fall out with your brother or your sister, you ought to think about his goodness unto you. And you ought to make up in your mind that I'm not going to let the devil in hell mess with my mind. 
I'm not going to let the devil in hell mess with my thinking. I'm going to thank uh, all of the goodness of the Lord because he has done great things for me. He's done great things. I say he's done great things. Is there anybody here who knows he's done great things? Every time the enemy starts messing with your mind, you just begin to think of how the Lord made a way for you. You just begin to think that he was bread when you've been hungry. You just begin to think uh, that he's been shelter in a time of a storm. Uh, you just begin to think uh, that he's been a doctor uh, in your sick room. He's been a lawyer in your cold room. You just begin to think of how he blessed you. Uh, to make it through college, to make it through life challenges. You just begin to think of how he's been your friend, of how he dried your eyes in the midnight hour. You just begin to think of how he held your hand and guided your feet. I say you begin to think of how he went to Calvary and bled and died on an old rugged cross. You just begin to think of how he got up early Sunday morning. You begin to think of all of his blessings over your life. Is there anybody here who knows he's been good to you? Do me a favor, look at your neighbor and tell them, neighbor, I don't have time to think negative thoughts. Tell them, neighbor, I've got to think positive thoughts. As a matter of fact, I'm going to praise him for everything, for everything, for everything, for everything, for everything, for everything that he's done in my life. Has he been good? Has he been good? Has he been good? Y'all playing with me. Has he been good? Why don't you shake your neighbor's head and say, neighbor, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. I'm walking and talking with my mind Stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Look at your neighbor and tell him, neighbor, it ain't no harm to keep your mind stayed on Jesus. Yeah! I'm through. I'm through. I'm through. I woke up this morning with my mind. Can I tell you, I ain't got time to be worried about foolishness. I got to do my best thinking. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on who? On Jesus. And when I think about what he done for me, I can't help but praise his name. 
Yeah. I woke up this morning with my mind. Yeah, stay. Yeah, I woke up this morning with my mind. Yeah, stay. Yeah, I woke up this morning with my mind. Yeah, stay. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yeah, I woke up this morning with my mind. Stay. Yeah, I woke up this morning with my mind. Hey, stay. Yeah, I woke up this morning with my mind. Hey, stay. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Where well, I'm walking and talking with my mind. Hey, stay. Hey, I'm walking and talking with my mind. Hey, stay. Hey, I'm walking and talking. Hey, stay. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, it ain't no harm to keep your mind. Hey, stay. Hey, it ain't no harm. Who say? Well, it ain't no harm. Hey, stay. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Listen, ah, the devil don't like it when your mind is stained. Ah, the devil don't like it when your mind ah, is stained. Ah, the devil don't like it when your mind ah, is stained. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. One more time. Well, I woke up this morning with my mind. Stay. Hey, I woke up this morning. Hey, stay. Hey, I woke up this morning. Hey, stay. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Listen, keep playing, musician. If you're here and you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, I need you all to help me to evangelize the house, all over the house. Would you stand to your feet? Stand to your feet all over the house. I need you to turn to the person that's nearest to you, look them in their face, and ask them the question, do you know Jesus? Ask them, do you know Jesus? Have you been born again? If the person cannot say yes, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take them by their hand, and I want you to bring them up the aisle and bring them to Christ. Do me a favor. Do me a favor. Turn to the person on the other side of you. Look at them. Take them by their hand and say to them, are you, the, are you a member of any church? Are you a member of any church? Are you a member of any church? If the person cannot say yes, if they need a church home, this is what I need you to do. I need you to take them by their hand, and I need you personally to walk them to the front. If you're in this place, you're unsaved, or you're unchurched, the doors of the church have been open for over 2,000 years. But we welcome you into the fellowship of the Mount Pleasant Church. If you're here, come on right now. Come on right now. Come on right now. Ah, I woke up this morning with my mind. Stay. Hey, I woke up this morning with my mind. Stay. Hey, I woke up this morning with my mind. Stay. Hallelujah. 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 
One more time. Well, the devil don't like it when your mind is staying. No, no, the devil don't like it when your mind stays. Well, the devil don't like it when your mind is stay. Hallelujah. 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 Right where you are, if you reach over and take your neighbor by the hand, I want to pray with you real quickly. Our Father and our God, we honor you, we bless you, and we thank you for the privilege of being in your house one more time. Father, we come in your presence acknowledging that we're not all that we should be nor ought to be, but we thank you now for forgiveness of sin. So, Father, it is our earnest prayer that as a result of our experience in this place that we'll go down, O oh God, doing our best thinking, remembering and reflecting on God that it's in you that we put our confidence. We thank you right now, O oh God, that the objective of our thinking is to help others. But then we thank you, O oh God, for the reality of the fact that we do what we do because we know you're coming back again. We know that your day of arrival is soon to happen. And so in the name of Jesus, we want to be ready when you come. Father, touch our minds right now. Help us to be on one accord. Help us not to be divided as a result of irrational thinking. But let our mind, oh God, the same mind that was in Christ Jesus be also in us. Transform us now by the renewing of our mind that we might prove what is that acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, Father, we love you right now. We thank you for healing. We thank you for deliverance. We thank you, O oh God, that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond and above that that we can think of or imagine. Yes. So, Father, we simply say to you now, O oh God, any way you bless us will be satisfied. Simply let your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And dear God, we'll be so careful to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. For we ask it in Jesus' name. And the people of God said amen. amen. Turn to somebody, give them a hug, and tell them, do your best thinking. Stay on Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Well, I'm walking and talking with my mind. Say, I'm walking and talking with my mind. Stay, I'm walking and talking with my mind. Stay, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. We're getting ready to worship the Lord in giving. Our deacons are coming. Our ushers are postured. We're going to honor the Lord in our giving. And then immediately we're going into our Lord's Supper and go down from this place. Amen. Amen. We simply ask of you that you will give as the Lord has blessed you to give, remembering that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Amen. Let us come now, let us come now and give unto the Lord. The music ministry will bless us with music, amen. <laughs> 